know why I'm here because I I'm actually a JavaScript guy. Um, not really. Um, but my name's Young. I run a small boutique um, generative design studio called Swarm. And generally, what I do in Swarm is stuff like that. Um, for my day job, I actually okay. So I was telling a friend about this. I either draw pictures of numbers or I draw pictures with numbers. So my day job actually includes uh, actually deals with building dashboards and shit. Or sometimes it deals with um, building uh, bespoke software. So this one's actually a software I made for Uniqlo in Singapore for their ticket interface. Um, this was literally one of the pieces I sent to them as a suggestion to what they should put on the ticket. So if you drop by, if you drop by uh, 313 over at Orchard, um, this is running on their interface. So, okay, so that's that. Um, that's a little bit of background of what I do. Um, I do generative design intersection with data visualization. But today it's more, okay, so the title of the talk is um, How to Draw Glorified Screensavers the Hard Way. Um, so I'll start with this guy's talk. I'll start with Brett Victor's talk. Um, Brett Victor gave a talk a while back called uh, Stop Drawing Dead Fish. And he talked about that simulation is actually um, the suitable modus operandi for the medium that is the computer, right? So if you, if you do draw a fish in illustration, it's still a dead fish. If you animate a fish, it is still a dead fish. Um, if you simulate a fish on a computer, I mean, it's still somewhat a dead fish, but it is much closer to life or seemingly like life um, compared to any of the other mediums that came before. So, um, there's this guy over at uh, Monash University, um, this guy called John McCormack, uh, not be confused with John McCormack of Quake. Um, he talks about generative art and generative design and the relationship between the man and the machine. On one end of the spectrum, you have the artist and the tool, and then somewhere in the middle, you give up a degree of control, you give the machine a little bit of agency, it becomes either an assistant or a collaborator, and all the way on the far end, um, an artist and a mentor. Right, and he talks about this other thing called um, the clone dike space, if I'm right. Um, he also referenced this in our paper before, which is about hunting for a creative space with um, what's this uh, generative algorithms um, that produces interesting work, because any anything can be a generative algorithm. Um, uh, 32 pixel by 32 pixel image, and then you randomly fill in RGB values in the middle, could be a generative algorithm, it's just not very interesting. So how do you narrow down the space of the output so that the ratio of output to the total space is actually interesting? Right, so that's, that's what I kind of try to do. Um, so let's start with this. So little things that I kind of built on a occasional basis, embryo, I guess. Uh, small toys like that. Or milk. Small toys like that. And then from metaballs, you always get flocking metaballs. Um, so it's a little bit of like a progression that way. Um, at the start, it's just random movement, and then you try to get something interesting by introducing some form of algorithm, right? Um, you try to tighten up the space to something that is somewhat interesting by tightening the algorithm. Um, so that is this other guy. Um, yeah. So this was actually for this was actually a commission. Uh, no, it was actually for a pitch ages ago for this thing called the President's Design Awards. Um, every year they would come out with a motif, and my suggestion, so I collaborated with the main studio, um, and my suggestion to them was to create an elk, like to have a generative system that creates, that blends all 10 years motifs together, and see whether you can actually create all forms of the motifs in between. So each, there are certain dimensions involved, and then you let it evolve accordingly. Um, not to go too much into detail, Essentially, at the back end of it, um, there's a neural network that is untrained that I use as a multi-dimensional noise machine just to roll dice for the different dimensions and let it interpolate between the dimensions. Um, 
something else is something like this, which, okay, potato. Uh, I've got a better version of that. Excuse me. So something else is something like this, which is um, essentially, this was for Design Film Festival back in 2015, um, which is essentially a glorified screensaver like all my other works. Um, at the back of it is actually a modified version of Sugarscape, like the Sugarscape simulation, where you actually have food and evolution and um, what's this, reproduction. So essentially what you're seeing is just the output onto um, onto the environment. Um, you don't see the organisms actually moving, it's just the effect it has on the environment. So hopefully that, hopefully this all answers like the glorified screensavers part. This is exactly what I do. Um, I hunt for ways to actually generate content um, in different ways. And a huge part of that, a uh, huge part of my objective is actually to get to interestingness is to try and narrow the space down to interestingness. So, um, the main one for this talk is actually, um, it kind of rose from here. So, there is um, there's this event going on right now called Singapore, um, and a friend of mine asked if it's possible to actually generate um, um, logos for Singapore, like, like to actually implement a generative system. Okay, just for disclaimer, um, it never really got it never really got implemented. Um, it got way above our heads, and then we kind of just pulled back and then save it for another day, All right? But um, so this is Singapore's logo. Ooh, okay, you just stop it there. Yeah. So that's that's the logo. It's it's, it's quite straightforward, completely geometric. Um, and I thought that it would make sense because it is about design and art and little snowflakes um, that we actually we implement based on a cellular automator system, right? Um, in this case, Wolfram's uh, cellular automator or a totalistic cellular automator because um, it looks like seashells. Um, you can actually get to patterns like seashells from cellular automator like that. As such, right? Um, so I got to that. I rendered, um, we rendered a couple of logos based on that, um, but it wasn't particularly interesting. Um, it gets a bit repetitive, or it gets a bit mechanical after that. So, in that sense, to do it the long and hard way is to actually, uh, okay, let me skip back a little bit. So there is this other guy called Carl McDonald. And he wrote a fairly long article on Medium, or he gave a fairly long talk as well about the return to machine learning. So he's an immediate artist. Um, yeah, like he works with code, but he mainly does with art, works with art. And one of his most recent artworks is actually with um, Google's AI experiments called the Infinite Drum Machine. And here he actually implemented Tsni to create essentially a visual drum machine. Right, um, in a sense that, okay, let's see if I can get to an example. I mean, this is Google, I guess. Okay, stop playing. Oh, yeah. Okay, I have no audio, but the whole idea is that um, I think he's got 100,000 samples, and then based on that, he applied T's knees to it to actually get some form of um, grouping and clustering to the sounds, like sounds that sound alike should be placed together, right? So based on that, I actually tried applying it on my side. Uh, so here we go. So, okay, this 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 is after a couple of this is after a couple of rounds of iteration. Uh, the thing about these knees, actually, I think about. Okay, so for this project, um, I started with directly using T-SNEs with, with um, pixel data. And the best implementation of T-SNE, okay, never mind, let's drop that first. Um, with pixel data, and it wasn't particularly very good. The clustering didn't come out to be very, um, it, the clustering or the, it's not really good. Um, the results didn't come out to have very good patterns, right? You can't really find outliers like that. 
So instead, I went back to the drawing board and I read up about this thing called uh, uh, autoencoders, which is a, I mean, yeah, unsupervised way of uh, unsupervised learning mechanism, right? So high dimensionality to most of the time, low dimensionality back to the same number of dimensions to your input. And then you essentially train the machine, you essentially train a neural network with um, uh, unlabeled data. So what I did for this one is that I actually trained a convolution autoencoder so that I can actually pull out the features. Because at the end of at the end of generating at the end of this, uh, where are we? Yeah. At the end of generating like all the cellular automator, I got like about a um, million odd combina uh, combinations, but I was too lazy to label them. So I, I sent it all through the autoencoder to get the features extracted automatically. So what happens is that after you, after you send, after you've trained the autoencoder, you chop off the end, you chop on the second half of the funnel, and you pipe it through the same model again just to get the features. I don't read, really, yeah, just to get the features. So based on that, then I applied T's knees again, and then I got this, right? So, um, yeah, and you get interesting patterns like this, uh, where these guys are grouped together based on based on the features that is detected. Oh, these guys like honeycomb shapes. Yeah, so based on that, I can actually go forward and apply, um, go forward and actually apply this to a to to train a recurrent neural network. So that's this which is actually pretty fresh. Um, this part I'm not doing particularly well. Um, I've come to learn like, I'm kind of like a monkey turning knobs in this case. Uh, many a times I'm really just tuning the, um, tuning the hyperparameters to see what goes on. Um, actually, I feel like a kid holding on to adult tools. I don't exactly know what I'm doing many a times. Um, something in Carl McDonald's um, essay about return to machine learning is that he talks about getting an intuition off the neural network, um, I'm just kind of dead. I'm just kind of getting an intuition of the neural network. Um, I don't particularly know the true implementation details. I kind of fumble around a lot. So that's that. Um, this part didn't go very well. Um, although as a segue, I would say that um, prior to this, I was actually running everything on the CPU. It was terrible. Uh, it takes about eight hours to run, to train a model. Um, moving across to the GPU was awesome, um, partly because that the feedback loop is much tighter, right? Like you can actually see and adjust and tw twist the knobs a little bit faster, and it's a little bit less annoying. So based on that, uh, yeah, based on that, not much else. So based on that, this is kind of what, okay, where the cellular automatic automator kind of kicks in is that it actually becomes the animation signature for, it's actually an animation signature for the logo. So each sliver of time, so this is the automator that is produced, or like that, and it just animates the logo accordingly. So based on that, you have some, vari some variations of this guy, which is not particularly interesting, but yeah, they do exist. So, that's that. I do actually have a lot of content. The only bit in Python really is actually this whole part. Um, this part on recur recurrent neural networks. And prior to that, um, piping things through the autoencoder, which is actually, which both are done through Keras. Um, Keras wrapped on top of TensorFlow. Apart from that, everything else in my stack is actually JavaScript. Um, so that's that. Thanks. Oh, yes. Have you looked at this generative adversarial stuff? The fake bedroom. Um, okay, so the question is, have I looked into generative adversarial? Uh, actually, no, because actually I don't know what that means. Um, can we go into detail on generative adversarial? So it's, it's GAN is what you should be, it's GAN. This is what we should be looking at. There's a, there's a way to generate pictures and move between pictures which it hasn't seen before. Okay, yes, okay, yes. 
Uh, I've looked at that as well. Um, okay, so in in Carl McDonald's talk about return to machine learning, he like he spoke about why he returned to machine learning, and I kind of agree as well. Which is um, machine learning. Machine learning essentially is just a bag of generic algorithms, and um, how I say this? Uh, classically, for machine learning, like rational random forest and all that stuff, it tends to lean towards uh, predictive models. Whereas um, with deep learning, with a bunch of the neural networks that we have now, it can lean towards, uh, or it can be very accessible to get to a generative model. Um, I guess for the JN stuff, it's closer to procedural content in the sense of being a assistive tool to create content. Um, I'm kind of leaning towards things like simulation, things like uh, uh, generating something from nothing. Um, closer to like Dwarf Fortress and how they do procedural content within Dwarf Fortress or the defunct No Man's Sky. Uh, yeah, like, like they're both, I, I agree that they're both uh, procedural content. Um, it's just how you apply the procedural content. Yeah. Okay, thank you.